Okay. Uh, thank, th thanks, everyone, for the virtual round of applause. It was virtually great. Um, all right. So for the talk today, I thought that um, instead of talking about uh, things that are happening, which is what I generally talk about because I am a developer, I thought, um, well, what will developers care about when they start uh, developing their applications? In general, we are talking about uh, graphics, uh, graphical applications, much like what um, Matthias was just talking to us about, like all of these uh, fancy um, graphic effects and stuff. And I think that it's important to understand what is the process for our application to go into our uh, user screens and displays and well, wherever they use it, because this changes every day. So that's why I thought it could make sense to um, well talk a little bit about uh, what uh, Wayland is. Um, I am also talking about Wayland specifically, not which is where they're going, at least uh, for the community as a whole. Some of us are more advanced in adopting it than others. But uh, in the end, it's not entirely the status quo yet. So it's still an, uh, a technology that uh, I am guessing that some of the developers need to embrace still. Uh, first of all, let me, ooh, the penguins look weird. This used to be a penguins emoji. I think that Big Blue Butter doesn't like my emojis. But I mean, uh, they were more cute as penguins. But sorry about that. Who am I? Uh, well, my name is Alej Paul. I am from Barcelona. I, uh, I have been developing KD software for the last uh, 15 years, maybe more. I get old quickly. Um, I am the KDV president as well right now, but uh, well, I'm still a software engineer. Uh, and I work for Blue Systems doing well software development within KD. I've been uh, involved both on developing different applications within KD Edu, for example, uh, KD Developer and our ID. But I've, I've also been working as well as uh, within Plasma, doing well our software center, and more recently working on Quinn, which is our well window manager back then and Wayland compositor nowadays. Uh, which is how I got to well thinking about this kind of topic. Now. Um, a bit the history for those of you who haven't been around forever, and I'm not gonna even claim that I've been around forever, even if I've been around for 15 years, because in Unix time, <laughs> forever takes much longer. Uh, X11, which is what, um, well, still a lot of people are using nowadays, was uh, a system that was designed in the in the 80s in uh, in conjunction with Unix. I'm not going to claim that I know what happened because I wasn't born even then. But I think that, uh, well, it shows two very things that are, I think, very important. One, that we've been working on technology that has been established over a very long time. And also that there was a need to for, for, for a change because, well, the world has definitely changed since back then. Now, uh, X11 and X3, which was the implementation that we, I guess, most of us started using when we uh, got introduced in in Linux, um, was developed for a uh, big uh, mainframe uh, computer. Ooh, sorry about that. Big mainframe, mainframe uh, computer so that they could put it in a university, in a company, and everybody would, well, join and uh, from their own dumb clients, and they would get well, their own little windows and things, uh, and get their their job done in a big computer elsewhere. Which is actually how we don't work nowadays. Now we still do a lot of our um, work in on the cloud, which we call it nowadays. Back then, it wasn't called the cloud, uh, but. Well, the graphical things, they always happen on our computers, be it well, a desktop computer, but also a mobile phone, uh, which is quite telling, right? Like back then, the graphics part were, was considered something hard to do, whereas nowadays, it's the kind of thing that we relegate into every device because we're good enough at it. 
Anyway, moving into the future, uh, which is actually when I started to uh, be part of the community, uh, there was this XGL project, which was all super fancy, which basically what it was doing was to include in the Linux desktop uh, or yeah, the desktop um, technologies that we had uh, been getting familiarized with for, for example, games. Uh, like, like OpenGL, uh, so that uh, well, our systems would be able to use the hardware accelerate uh, acceleration that that we had available, right? Uh, something that I learned at university, and many of you will have as well, is that the universal way of making any program run faster is by making uh, well hardware ad hoc for solving that problem, right? And well, graphics was a problem back then. Like I said from the from the beginning, uh, and we got eventually hardware to do it. That was uh, well by two thousand and six. It was already quite fancy. Um, there were a lot of well three D based games already that people were running, even consoles and this kind of stuff. So it made a lot of sense to use it on on our desktops now. Um, this was something that was put on top of, of X11, because that's what all of our applications uh, understood. And it was the only thing that we had that could talk to our uh, graphics cards. And well, it kind of worked. And it had a very famous demo with a cube rotating between the different um, the different uh, desktops, virtual desktops, which was fancy and I mean today it doesn't sound like that impressive but back then it was like look at what these crazy people are doing and by the way this wasn't this didn't really happen in a bubble this is uh, around this time also Microsoft started doing that for Windows as well and so did Apple for for Mac OS um, so this created this super complex uh, kind of solution that uh, was not really future-proof. So people started working into alternatives. X11 and Xorg already back then uh, started to get adapted into these uh, kind of premises. And so did, um, uh, so, so we started getting it. And if you today start using uh, an X11 based Linux desktop, you will see a lot of these features already available. It's not like you need Wayland to do to do all of this stuff. But eventually in 2013, according to Wikipedia, all of these dates are according to Wikipedia. I'm not a historian myself, sorry about that. Uh, we started uh, developing uh, Wayland, which is what we are gonna uh, cover during this talk today. Now, um, but, 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 Click. So why, why, why did we need uh, other things? What do we, as application developers now, we need to think about two target platforms in practice that, rather than just the one, um, at, at least for, for a transitional time? Well, uh, for, for starters, we want stability. Uh, the development of, of Xorg and compositors on top became like it definitely works and it worked for a good 30 years without uh I would say without problems, but then it weren't my problem. So I, I know that a lot of people uh well sweated a lot uh during the process. And well, people eventually wanted to have this more simpler solution where from uh, a compositor uh you could uh decide how things work, how things uh, communicate between one another. And the way you have as a maintainer to say, this is stable, this is something that I, I, I feel capable of delivering to my, my users is by being able to somewhat control and uh, be able to decide on what the stack is. Um, this is something that we do get by, by Wayland uh, through the, the, the newer design. We also uh, are looking towards having performance graphics, right? So in the X11 model, we were we had the applications talking to the server, the applications talking to the desktop, uh, well, the compositor, and 
there was a lot of moving pieces over there. What we have right now, though, with Wayland is a much simpler architecture where all of the applications or clients, like we generally call them in Wayland, talk to the compositor. The compositor is already doing graphics calls fairly low level or as low level as it wants to uh, the, the graphics card. And the graphics card does its thing. Now, this means that there is a lot of the infrastructure that uh, X11 was giving us for free that we have had to, to implement. But then this also means that if uh, you right now tell the maintainer of your system, be it uh, GNOME or Plasma or Sway or whichever, that something is not working as it should, they get to give you a proper answer rather than saying, Oh yeah, you know this is uh, back in X11. Reported to them, problem done. Which is something that sadly has happened, and it has put our position as a product uh, in jeopardy at uh, different points in uh, in history. Right? This is not something that should happen. We should have the full ownership of what we deliver to be able to uh, well solve all of the problems. And the other very important part is um, how the components communicate within an, with each other. Like I said, uh, on on X11, well, I don't, I didn't say it. X11 was like a um, huge observer uh, pattern where every client could see everything that has that were that was happening. There's something that has been tried to uh, address in different ways, like for example from from Flatpak, but in the end. Um, you get uh, all of the events that go into every client, and then you decide which one you, which ones you want because you know who you are yourself, right? But it's in the end possible on X11 as is uh, to know what things people are typing on, uh, well, text fields on another window, or to place ourselves wherever we want, and this this kind of stuff. This is a problem. This is a security problem for starters because. Um, <laughs> we don't want all of our applications uh, to know about everything. We have not had a lot of problems about uh, security on Linux, for example, or at least major ones that we know about. But it's only been because, well, people have been reasonably good at uh, choosing where they get the, their applications from. But in the end, horrible things could have happened. And I'm pretty sure that horrible things have happened somewhere because this could just happen, right? Um, writing a keylogger for X11 as it is used nowadays still is trivial and everybody can do it well, sitting down uh, in an afternoon, right? Whereas, uh, but that's not ideal. Um, what we do on, on Wayland instead is since you only talk to the compositor, the compositor will only be talking to you about the the things that you're supposed to know about. This has a, a, another interesting ramification, which is um, the state machine that you end up getting is much simpler because every client is not depending on the states of all of the other clients, but instead that you just have the state of, uh, of that is the conclusion of what the compositor has been telling you, but only the compositor and maybe the rest of the debug services that you talk to and maybe hardware, but well, not the state of every other client around you, which I think that is also part of why this is good news. So how does this work? I keep talking about the compositor and the clients. Well, uh, let me show you this graph because graphs are always better at explaining things. Uh, here it shows three applications. The applications have buffers. This is only depicting uh, how it works for the, the rendering part, but I think that it's quite explanatory in itself. So every application, we have a set of buffers, which are well, every frame that that you want to and that that you want to render on on the on the screen for your application. It will will tell the compositor, "I have a new one," or uh, and you get to present it. Now the compositor will put it. Whatever, however they like in Windows, it will. It could be on any other way as well. It could 
be doing mosaics. He could be doing like we have different kinds of of compositors as well, like like Sway for example, which is tiling. We have well the normal window like we do on on Plasma, and they do in, in GNOME as well. Because in the end, it's part of a compositor's role to decide how these things should be working and how these things are working. Um, this graph is is a bit limited though, because if <laughs> applications could only send things, well, life would be very boring for everyone who wasn't a video player. Uh, the compositor is also connected to uh, other hardware that uh, we will be using for input. Think about um, touch pads, uh, mouse, mice, uh, keyboards, uh, tablets, um, anything really. Uh, you can also think about uh, virtual keyboard kind of use case. It's not hardware, but it's something that uh, it's something that the, actually the compositor understands how it needs to be done. It will get the information and it will be sent to the application in the right way. And the compositor will be sending all of these application uh, to the applications, and the applications will be sending back uh, new buffers with their updated information or whatever they need. Uh, applications could also be talking about other stuff. It's not like applications can only talk about uh, tell about frames, but it can, they can tell about anything. We will see a bit later how this all works. Next. Now, uh, I, I, I would say that so far it's quite normal. And I would even say that's probably what you expect to hear. I am not sure. Uh, but what kind of implications does this have? Because in the end, what I think that we're all saying is that applications used to look a certain way on X11, and they actually end up looking exactly the same on uh on Wayland, how is that possible why does it this happen and <laughs> why does Wayland matter after all right but uh in the end for for application developers uh, this shouldn't change that much because we're all relying or most of us we're relying on uh well frameworks to do this kind of uh stuff there is jdk there is Qt, there's sdl for example which is used more for uh games and these, they do support um, Wayta, Wayland natively or through a backend. So it basically just works. And as, a, as an app developer, you can mostly assume that things work normally uh, with an asterisk that we will uh, go through later. But, uh, but you can focus on making your application great and, and hope that the I hope that the application will work on X11, it will work on Wayland, and possibly other platforms like Windows, Mac, Android, that most of us support. They should work in general, right? Because in the end, painting into a rectangle is, well, as hard as it can be, right? That doesn't mean that all of them support them. For example, Electron and actually, well, Chromium and Firefox aren't all that ported yet. Uh, Firefox, you need to enable a thing. Chromium, I think that the next version is we'll, we'll start shipping it by default um, with an also an opt-in uh, setting. And Electron being based on Chromium is also uh, lacking there, but hopefully soon uh, it will start working. Actually, I think that the next Chromium 87, which happens in two or three days, not that much longer, they will have this, this option. And I'm quite, quite excited about that. Uh, also, something worth considering and keeping in mind is that while well, all of these support Wayland natively and properly, we also have a component called xWayland, which uh, supports uh, X11 applications. So if your application, for any reason, relies on something specific about X11, you can have your application go through uh, XWayland. And this will make things work properly, as long, of course, as the compositor is doing things right. So today, for example, if you run an Electron application from, um, well, as they're meant to be used, you will have them running 
through uh, XWLAN, um, as well as the web browser, for example, also unless you don't set the environment variables. But it's slowly changing. And actually, most more or less, everything works as it should. And you should notice there's uh, small uh, details like, uh, for example, um, scaling works a bit differently, and applications look a bit blurrier if you have a, uh, a scaling system, at least for us. I think that other compositors will have the same problem. Um, also, there are patches to solve that. So in the future, it might not end up not being the case, but this is what you get today. But it's not a big problem. Like Many of us have been using Wayland only for the na last few days, and we've all been able to do uh, well everything that we used to do on, on Linux without feeling um, sorrow. Um, I've been talking a lot about um, this communication between the compositor and the client. What does it look like? Uh, and it happens through protocols now. Uh, well, when your application start starts, it will it will connect into a socket, and they will start communicating. Much like well, any communications happens through a socket, right? You read things, you get to read things, etc. Uh, this is not something that even if you were a toolkit uh, developer, you would have to care about that much because well, on one hand, there is libwayland and it's tooling that takes care of that. Um, so well, it's already somewhat abstracted so that you can comf comfortably have this kind of um, back and forth. Um, as, as soon as you have to start looking into one of these protocols, you will start seeing this XML file. So I figured it would be useful to show a little bit about what it looks like. Uh, so I created the most innovative uh, protocol called the protocol potato, which does nothing. And it's not supposed to work or anything. It just <laughs> meant uh, for you to see what kind of things it does. Uh, so I mean, this is a perfectly valid XML file. And if you pass it to uh, well, Wayland tooling, it won't give you an error. It just will be useless. But what you can see is that you have a protocol. Each protocol will have different interfaces that you guys could see them like as objects, if you want, I guess. Um, different interfaces will have different kind of uh, items, mostly requests and events. And you should read these protocols as if you were a client. So the in, in this case, a client can request uh, to get a potato and will eventually be notified about the cooked event, right? Um, so when you are a client that implements this, um, you will have this kind of semantics uh, allowed. You can see also the request can have arguments. So you can say, say get the potato for this surface. Uh, no, sorry, like here is getting a potato, and it's the surface that is returned. But you could pass things like, give me the potato number three, or give me the potato called banana, whatever. Uh, and eventually, it will be getting a callback that is use, usually like a function pointer or a virtual function. If you use uh, object-oriented uh, programming that about uh, the cooked signal whenever it's it's emitted. Um, if you're a compositor, though, which none of you are, because here we are app developers right now in the context of this talk, what you do, though, is the get potato is something that you never call, that you're called to offer potato. And the event is something that you do send, right? So eventually, when the event happens, you get to uh, emit it for your clients to know. And something uh, that I think it's useful to understand is that when you do send these things from the compositor, you say, to which client do you want to send it? I mean, it can be to all of them, but not necessarily. And actually, usually not all of them, but whoever you're replying to or anything in this regard. Now, this all sounds very abstract. How do we turn that into something that uh, looks more or less practical? Well, um, we're going to get to that later. 
you can see the protocols available uh, officially in the repository that I pasted on this. Um, I pasted, but yeah, that you can see over here. Maybe somebody can put it on the chat or something. But essentially, you will see uh, a bunch of them. They're, they are split into two big categories, stable and unstable. Stable, what they mean is that they are not meant to change in the foreseeable future. Unstable is that they might still be uh, developed. All of them, they are agreed upon by uh, different uh, actors in the, in the community, being the different compositors. They don't all need to agree that they are all useful and to implement them. But uh, at least there needs to be a critical mass that is using them and, and implementing them. Otherwise, well, it would be quite frustrating to say to find something over there and say, I'm going to I'm going to use this protocol because it's exactly what I think uh, what I need as a as an application developer, but then not find any compositors that uh, that do it. Uh, most of the things you will find over there uh, should be supported. Uh, I think I mentioned there's the stable ones and there's the unstable ones In stable ones. They could change over time. And kind of the idea is to polish the unstable ones so that they can become so that they can become stable over time and well enjoy life. Now, these are the ones that you should uh, care the most about as an application developer because they are the ones that will more or less be implemented by all compositors. Um, but then since well, creating a desktop environment is not always the simplest of tasks, uh, we've collectively uh, started, uh, created a myriad of different protocols that uh, are used. For example, in Plasma, we have uh, several ones for communicating with uh, Shell, which is uh, definitely a specific kind of uh, client that needs to do and to know about things that other clients will well, shouldn't know about or will not need it anyway. Things like listing uh, windows, this kind of stuff, you don't want, or you don't need every application to know about this kind of stuff. So we only send that, send that to the to the privileged kind of uh, clients. Uh, others also have similar things. It, some of them, for example, also extend what the standard ones do. But in general, uh, these are some that you shouldn't need. I did place them here, though, because they might be useful for you. And as an application developer, if you say, see that something is super important for you, you can always say, how about we standardize this one because I want to base my application on this concept. Um, and otherwise, I cannot I cannot have my application do do its own thing, and this is something that could definitely happen. Uh, some that we've created in the past has been uh, well shared between different projects, and I could see them uh, moving into more stable spaces eventually over time. Now, um, there was the XML file, and there was the libwayland thing I told you about. So how do we mix them in, in a way so that you don't have to become a weird protocol ninja so that uh, and that everything reasonably works? Well, there's these uh, tools that you can use to generate uh, code from an XML file that will work for your application. So basically, what you do as a, as a, as an application when you want to interact directly with a, with a protocol is that you will create a registry. The registry will announce to you all of the different um, interfaces that or yeah protocols that are available. And then you get to say, all right, I am interested on this one. Give me this one, and I will work with it. And what you will do is that or you will get uh, an instance of a weird object that you will get to uh, pass into one of the uh, classes generated by these scanner files, classes or objects, depending on the kind of um, of language that you use. There's a Wayland scanner that will generate C, uh, uh, .c file and a .h file, the Qt Wayland scanner, same-ish, but with C++ things. There's the PyWayland scanner, which I have never used, but it 
generates Python code, uh, I guess. I saw that there were others, like for Rust and this kind of stuff. But in, in general, the idea is that since it's not tied to any language or any technology, you, but you definitely want to uh, communicate easily with with the, with the protocol, and you should be able to do so with the semantics that are provided from the from the XML file, which is well, what you care about uh, at that point. Of course, if you ever decide to come up with a protocol, you will have to implement it for your client and then for all of the compositors. So beware with doing that and, well, don't try to consider this a solution for everything. Um, there's also the discussion about when you should be using uh, Wayland protocols and when you should be using uh, Dbus, for example. Um, there are things that have been using Dbus that actually theoretically and technically could be ported into Wayland protocols, but there's no good reason to do that. And we, we will never probably do it. Like, I don't know, I'm thinking power management, right? You have a Dbus service that is already doing its thing. And uh, well, it doesn't have a big problem with that. So it could make sense to have uh, applications not be exposed to to those, but in general, uh, as soon as they see them, they should be able to continue working with these device uh, uh, interfaces. And that will continue being the case, right? So as compositors, we have several of them already implemented. There's Weston, which is kind of the reference implementation. Uh, and it lives together in free desktop with uh, Wayland itself. There's Queen, which is the one we've been doing for Plasma. There is Matter for GNOME. There's the real roots and Sway. The real roots, as far as I understood, uh, is a framework to create uh, compositors. And actually, there's several of them already based on it. And then there's Sway, which is the one who, that was created by the one the, the people who created the Allure roots, which is a funny looking one. And then there's the Qt Whalen compositor, which is well done by Qt for doing more embedded kind of things. Although some people are creating uh, proper desktop environments around it. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, things to keep in mind as an application developer. Well, I think that uh, something that has been a bit of a problem since the beginning for certain applications has been the positioning. If your application is weird in that it needs to be placed in a specific region of the window, uh, you might have problems doing that. Uh, on X11, you could say, tell me where I am, and it would tell you the X and Y of, of the well, position of your application. But it would give you like all of the di dimensions of your windows, uh, which you still need to know, because you need to know how much pixels you need to render at any moment. But um, what we don't know is about the, the positioning. Um, and from that, we can derive. It's not just about the positioning itself. It's about how the compositor now is the one with authority about where things are placed. Something that also we, sorry, something that we used to do on on X11 was the braces window, and a, a window decided to move on front, and uh, well, because it thought that it was very special and important. It is something that it cannot be done right now, we're working on it, but well, it's the kind of things that needs, needs to be uh, thought um, properly. Um, the, another thing that happened is that there were a lot of processes that uh, their function was to, um, well, see what others were doing or making things happen on, on other, other clients. For example, think of a virtual keyboard. In X11, you could implement a virtual keyboard by saying, and now the x is pressed, and now the y is pressed. But this is kind of weird, right? You don't want a random application to be sending keys to another random application. You can implement um, virtual keyboards on Wayland right now, and it works fine, but it needs to be done properly. And by properly, I mean using a specific protocol that is about that rather than just saying, this is what people definitely need. They need the, this event as if it was coming from the keyboard, which is kind of a weird premise. Um, 
if you want to le le learn further, there's the official documentation, which is fine. Uh, it's quite extensive. Uh, there's also the Whalen book, which was the, uh, created by uh, one of the Sway or the um, lead Sway developer, I think. Uh, it's pretty good. I ended up reading things over there when I was starting, and I needed to understand why things were like they are. So I recommend you to take a look and see what's what over there. Other than that, uh, well, I mean, there's definitely tons of other documentation all over the internet. Uh, if there's something specific you need, I'm sure that I or maybe other people will be able to help you with that. But um, yeah, if anyone has any questions right now, would be the right moment to talk about them. So it looks like we have one question in the shared notes. Um, it says, what do you think about the KWinFT fork? Well, the KWinFT fork, it's something that you can ask the main developer. He used to work with uh, Plasma on it. He decided that he wanted to work alone, and he's now working alone, or I don't know if he's working with other people, but. I don't really have I don't I don't know why it matters. The next question is what is the status of Wayland for I'm going to butcher this. Um XF X phase and mate or mate. There we go. Um, yeah. Um well I wouldn't know, you would have to ask uh, their developers, which is kind of the thing that you have less of a shared infrastructure over there. As far as I know, which is not that much, is that they were using GNOME infrastructure for this kind of thing. So I would expect them to be able to use Matter. But uh, I am sure that somebody on the chat here will be able to give you a better answer than I have right now. It looks like that's all the questions we have. Thank you, Alesh. As always, yeah. a wonderful presentation. And um, we will see you around, I suppose. You'll see me around. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening.